When I mention the word roly-poly, the first thing that probably comes to your mind is the small little dark gray ones you used to find outside all the time as a kid. But what if I told you that there are thousands of exotic species of roly-polies, otherwise known as isopods? Now, as mentioned, there's the classic roly-poly, pill bug, whatever you used to call them, that you find outside all the time as a kid. Then there are other species that are more exotic, such as panda king isopods, dairy cow isopods, and the ever so popular rubber ducky isopod. The focus of today's video will be setting up an enclosure for my orange dairy cow isopods. Now these are dairy cow isopods, except they are the orange variety, so they're the same except orange. But today I will be setting up a naturalistic enclosure for them. Now I got these guys at the Reptile Expo a couple of weeks ago. If you want a little more information on that, definitely go check out that video. But today I'm going to try and make the ultimate dairy cow isopod setup. Now in total, I did get 30 of them and I would like for them to breed, so I'm going to make the enclosure rather large. And speaking of enclosure, that's the first thing that I need to do. I don't actually have one, I need to build one. So the first thing we need to do is go to the garage. Okay, we're here in the garage. And now that we're in the garage, it's time to start the project. So like I said, this is going to be basically the same as the mantis enclosures. So it'll follow basically the same process. You know, I'll start by cutting the panes of glass and then siliconing those together. And then I'll go in and, you know, add all the rest of the good stuff. But that is the first thing that I'm going to do today is start by cutting this glass. So let's cut this glass. Starting off with a pane of glass, I use a ruler as well as a tape measure to get the size that I want. I then cut along that line and snap off the excess. I then repeat this process a couple times, and once I have all the pieces, I assemble them with a little bit of painting tape. With the tank assembled, the last thing I'll do is run a bead of silicone along all the seams to help hold things together. Okay, so now that we're at this point, tank's looking pretty good. I'm pretty happy with the size. It's honestly a little bit bigger than I had originally intended to do, but that's completely fine. The whole idea is for them to, you know, thrive and even breed in there. So I'm hoping that I just give them a little extra room and eventually they'll fill up the space. But the next thing that I need to do, similar to how I do the mantis enclosures, is I need to put the wood frame on. And to do that, I have these wooden dowels. The first thing I do is take the measurements that I need for the tank, I then transfer those measurements onto a wooden dowel and cut it with a saw. I then repeat this process for every piece that I need measuring and cutting, before taking a piece that's a bit thicker to a table saw so I can run it through it and thin it down a bit. Once I have all of the pieces cut, I use a little bit of sandpaper to smooth them out a bit and then apply my stain. I repeat this process for each individual piece, making sure to sand them smooth and cover the entire thing with stain. Once all the pieces have had an adequate amount of time to dry, I hit them with a coat of some clear spray paint to help protect them from water as well as give them a little bit of a shine. Then once that's dry, I use a little bit of epoxy and start applying it to each piece and then sticking it to the tank. I repeat this process for every piece until the whole tank is covered. So the enclosure is now done. I really, really love the way this turned out and this will be the perfect canvas for us to continue making this setup. So the next thing that we need to take care of is the background. Now, usually for a background like this, I would get some XPS foam and do the dry lock technique, but that's not really the feel that I want for this one. I want this to really, really feel like a type of forest, almost, almost like a tree has fallen down in a forest and it's being taken over by nature because realistically, this is where isopods would live. Also for a shorter, longer tank like this, that whole style will just work so much better. So instead of doing the dry lock technique, what I'm gonna do is I have a bunch of cork flats and I'm going to strategically place those over the background as well as maybe a few rocks and other things. And I'm going to create my own background just out of natural materials that I have lying around. So now that I have a background layout that I'm happy with, the next thing I'm actually gonna do is start scaping this thing. And the reason for that is because like I've done in the past, I really want my scapes to blend in with my backgrounds. I want it to feel like one cohesive piece. I want it all to like blend and just it, make it all feel like one. In my opinion, this really helps just make the project feel more natural and it looks better. Starting off with a couple different pieces of driftwood, I just start scaping. Now, there is a bit of a process and a plan that I wanted for this. Like I mentioned, I wanted this scape to kind of feel like a fallen tree or branch or something that's kind of been taken over by nature. So keeping that in mind, I was able to come up with something that I thought looked pretty good. In order to lock everything in place though, I will have to remove the scape first, so that's what I did. I started by taking out all the pieces and then hot gluing a few of the background pieces to the piece of foam. That way they'll stay there and they won't get moved. I then repeated this process for every piece, including a couple of the rocks, before taking this outside to the garage and gluing a couple pieces of foam to the side so that I could get an area to reassemble the scape. Once I had the scape reassembled, I started using some expanding foam to help lock everything in place. Now in doing so, I'm not using a lot of foam, just enough to fill all the little gaps. I didn't want this to be too crazy, I just want to cover up all the little pink areas, so nothing too dramatic. As for some of the smaller bits of the scape, I decided just to use some super glue to attach them. Then after allowing the foam to cure, I came back and started picking and peeling some of the pieces away to remove that unnatural texture. 
Once that was complete, I applied super glue all over the foam and sprinkled a little bit of rock dust and smaller pieces of rock over that. I repeated this process over the entire course of the rocky area, as well as adding a few smaller rocks just to help bring in a little bit more of that detail. Then I did the same process except with cocoa fiber for the areas where the scape was, as well as for the cork bark, and I think it turned out great. So now the background has been complete. I really, really love the way it turned out. I think I definitely could have done better in terms of like blending a few things and maybe making it look a little more seamless, but the technique is there and that's what matters because then I can apply this technique to other tanks. I can work on it, improve it, all that stuff. So the next thing we need to do to make this thing functional is add a false bottom. And in order to add a false bottom, I'll start with a bit of Lika. Lika is a great medium for a false bottom as it takes up a lot of space and absorbs water. Anyway, I'll pour that into the tank in a substantial amount before flattening and leveling it out. Then using a piece of mesh, I'll set the tank on top of that and cut around the edges. Leaving a bit of a lip around the edges is a good thing as it allows you to fold the pieces of the mesh up against the sides of the tank to further prevent substrate from getting through. As you can also see, I have a few anchor points for the piece of wood that I unfortunately wasn't able to get the mesh under, so I just cut a little slit and worked around that. So now that the false bottom has been complete, the next thing I need to move on to is the substrate. Now for my substrate, I use a modified ABG mix. A normal ABG mix would also work as well, but the mixture that I use consists of three part cocoa fiber, two part reptile bark, one part sand, and a half a part of charcoal. After adding all the ingredients, I thoroughly mix everything together to get a consistent mix. After thoroughly mixing all of the ingredients, I start adding it to the bottom of the tank. Now in doing so, I am sloping it up towards the back to create depth. However, for this specific build, I also wanted multiple layers, so I filled in the area behind the piece of wood and built that up a bit. I tried to blend the substrate with the wood as best I could, filling any little gaps and areas that would help blend it together. With the substrate in place, it's finally time to move on to the plants. Now, similar to how I do with my mantises, before actually adding the plants, I'm going to prep them. And the way that I prep my plants is I start by removing each plant from its pot and breaking up all of the soil from the roots, or at least as much as I can. After that, I take them to a source of water, like outside or a sink, and I wash off any of that remaining soil. Then just to further ensure that I get off as much as possible and remove any potential pesticides, I soak them in warm dechlorinated water for about 10 to 15 minutes. This will not only ensure that the plants are properly clean, but it'll also help mitigate risk of pesticide and other harmful pests. So now that the plants are prepped, I started the planting by adding a rabbit's foot fern towards the top right. Ferns are commonly found in forests, and again, I wanted this to have a forest feel, so this is the perfect place to start. After that, I ended up adding a dracaena towards the bottom left. I really love these plants, and they're a great hardy species for enclosures like this. I then added a couple more ferns, as well as a few cuttings of ivies and ficus to finish things up. So now that the planting is finished, it's finally time to finish this thing up. And what I mean by that is I have a bunch of smaller details to add, such as leaf litter. I've even got some moss that I'm going to throw in there, a little bit of ficus, just stuff like that. And then, of course, getting the actual isopods in there. But I'm just going to go in and add the final details, and we're going to get this thing finished. So let's get this thing finished.
thank you guys for watching this video. I really appreciate you sticking around till the end. This was probably one of the most trust the process projects that I've worked on in a long time. I scrapped the background like twice. I tried like three different techniques. I didn't show it because it was a whole process and it was really frustrating. But in the end, honestly, this has been and probably is my favorite enclosure that I have made to date. I don't know what about it. It just everything blends really well. It really captured that forest vibe that I want. And the isopods seem to be enjoying it. Over the past three or four days I've had it set up, I did lose a couple of them, maybe five or six. I'm really not sure as to why. I've checked temperature and humidity and all the parameters and stuff and everything's fine. So if you guys have any ideas as to why that could be, whether it's just stress or whatever, I'd be curious to know. But other than that, everything is doing great and I'm really, really loving this enclosure. I definitely want to do more work with isopods, especially rubber duckies sometime down the line. But those are a bit more on the expensive side and harder to care for, so we'll see about that. But that's going to do it for this week. Again, thank you guys for sticking around till the end. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a like if you enjoyed it. And I'll see you guys next week.